Are you ready? Okay, Governor Duncan, you start the next committee meeting. Good morning. I'd like to call the Student and Academic Affairs Committee to order. Mikey, would you call the roll? Uh, Mr. Franklin. Here. Mrs. Frost. Here. Dr. Marshall. Here. Mr. Martin. Here. Commissioner Smith. Mr. Stavros. He's here. He's here. <laughs> Dr. Yost. Here. Uh, Madam Chair, you have a floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> We've got a lot on our agenda today, and with your permission, just kind of as we kind of looked at the, after we published the agenda, um, we, I'd like to make an adjustment to our flow a little bit. Um, but first, if we could, so what I will be doing is, if we, after we do the minutes, um, I'd like to move up our regulations and then go into academic programs and continue with the rest of the agenda if any, no one has an objection. Um, but with that, is there any approval for the minutes or any additions or changes? Is there a second? All in favor? Post. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to get um, Vicki, where's Vicki? <laughs> okay, and uh, Richard to come up. Um, as we, we've got two regulations that we need to discuss today. The first one is item that's shown on your agenda as 4A is consideration of a public notice to, of intent to amend regulation 7.005 related to residency for tuition programs. Um, although we have to adopt the regulations for this, um, it's important to note, and Vicki's going to walk us through, the fact that the statutes really control a lot of what is and is not residency. So um, yeah, we, we have some limitations on what we can and can't do with this. But Vicki, if you could please walk us through it. Uh, thank you, Governor Duncan. Yes, as you just said, the residency statute itself is an extremely detailed statute that sets forth criteria for both the initial classification of residency status and reclassification of residency status. The primary amendment to our regulation involves the process by which a student can seek reclassification of his or her status from out of state to in state for tuition purposes. Over the past several years, OPAGA issued a, a number of reports that raised the concern that colleges and universities were perhaps being too lenient in the way that they reclassed students who came in from out of state, moved in, but were here solely for the purpose of attaining a post-secondary education. So the legislature amended the residency statute uh, to place a higher burden on students who were initially classified as non-residents to seek reclassification. Um, what they did was they require students to provide a clear and convincing documentation that supports permanent legal residency in Florida for a 12 consecutive month period prior to seeking reclassification and which would also dispel the notion that they're here just for temporary residence solely to go to school. Our amendment implements this new criteria by requiring students to provide, th at a minimum, three documents that support their permanent residency status in Florida. And those documents are set forth in statute, and they include things like voter registration, driver's license, uh, high school transcripts. And for initial classification, you have to provide two. But for reclassification, we're requiring students to provide universities with three documents that reflect that they now are a permanent residence of, resident of Florida and are not here simply to obtain a post-secondary education. We're also requiring that they, these documents indicate that they have relinquished their residency status in the state from which they came. Um, we're also asking this, this res regulation is in a little different posture than what we normally have with regulations in that last year in the governance rewrite, the legislature did not change the rulemaking reference in the residency statute. So we're actually asking the court, uh, the court, excuse me, you can tell I'm a lawyer, we're asking the board for authorization to dual track this both as a regulation and we're going to submit it to the chapter 120 rulemaking process. So that's what we're asking for today, is approval to publish in the Florida Administrative Weekly as a rule and approval to post on our regulation, our, our regulation website as a proposed regulation. Thank you. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, I do have one question, it may be Richard or you, Vicki. Um, we had had some discussion when we did the Veterans Symposium and that there had been some particular issues for veterans and their residency. I know the answer is going to be we can only do what we can do, but could you just kind of refresh our memory on how it impacts that? 
Well, you're right. We can only do what the statute allows us to do on residency, and Richard would have to address the specific issues they raised, but I know that the statute has not been amended to address any of those. Well, basically what has happened is um, we did uh, work with some of the veterans groups and uh, the Florida Department of Veterans Affairs uh, last year to help them craft language that didn't uh, impact our universities. And uh, the big problem we're running into is that there, there's a real reluctance on the part of a lot of people to, to open that statute from our perspective because um, every time you open a statute, you, you know, sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. We are not sure yet if the Florida Department of Veteran Affairs plans to open it, but they do have language that, they, that um, we have uh, circulated uh, amongst our universities and, and gotten agreement on if they do decide to do so. Um, I think there's some very legitimate concerns on the part of veterans, and we tried to address them when we were drafting that language, and one of the primary ones being, you know, that many, many times they will uh, out-process at a location pretty far from where they're actually going to end up, and so it would give them a, at least a year to, uh, you know, to bounce around after getting out of the service before, you know, they had to prove that they had not established residency somewhere else. Thank you. Well, I mean, I do think that's an important issue. It's a growing population on almost all of our campuses. So just as that progresses, maybe just keep us posted on that, please. Are there any other questions on this regulation? Is there a motion for approval? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, our next regulation is um, one that Vicki, I guess you guys going to both stay up here for this one. Um, as we um, start to look at the, um, it's a public in, an another notice for public intent to amend regulation 8.001 related to the authorization of new academic programs. Um, it's being amended in part to conform with statutory changes back from 2010 and in part to clarify policies with regard to the approval process and program duplication. Um, Richard Stevens will walk us through these changes to the regulation and Vicki will provide us an overview of the state's partnership um, with the and commitments with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights um, re which relates to a portion of this amendment or regulation. Richard. Yes, ma'am. Well, if you um, turn in your um, committee package to um, page 31, you'll see the um, what we have done with this particular regulation is do a strike call and then an underline for what looks like a whole new um, regulation. But in fact, it's not. We uh, ended up with so many grammatical changes that we needed to make and clarifications on the use of policy versus regulation versus, you know, with regard to the Board of uh, Trustees. And, and also needed to move some things around to help clarify the process for the universities. So it, it was uh, a major confusion when you try to do just a uh, underlying strike through of the, of the uh, original reg. So what you have here is a regulation that is in large part still the policies that were put in place by this board about four years ago that uh, does two primary things. It uh, creates the criteria for the development of a degree proposal and, uh, and uh, you know, and basically identifies those things that uh, this, the board expects the uh, universities to attend to in developing their proposals. And you think of a degree proposal as a business plan, and you can uh, run down starting on uh, um, item uh, parens three on page uh, 31, and you'll, you'll see the criteria that it has been laid out. I'm not going to touch on that right now because I want to touch up first on the, uh, the new degree of program approval authority and process which begins on page 34. This is the second part of this regulation that I think is very important. Um, and with the, the budget cuts and everything that everyone's experienced, it, you know, of course the board office has as well. At one time, uh, the board office used to take and uh, look at all degree proposals and also uh, hire consultants to do a curriculum review on the proposals. And there was no board of trustees in there to, uh, to provide that first uh, that first accountability uh, review. And what we want to do is take advantage of all of the processes that existed at the university uh, for review, uh, development and review of new degree proposals 
So about four years ago, we put into place uh, a kind of a two-step uh, process where the universities were really responsible for most of the curriculum review and the, uh, the assurances that the resources and everything were in place. And that uh, was one of the primary concerns then that we expect the Board of Trustees to have dealt with. And then the, at the, uh, for the PhD programs, our doctoral programs at the board level, then that would leave the board really looking at the, at the system uh, issues that were associated with adding a new PhD degree. The other thing that uh, this um, regulation did was, was really kind of codify the, uh, the authority of the university boards of trustees with regard to the approval of baccalaureate programs, master's programs, specialist programs, and retain a review process of, at, the, uh, at the state level by the Office of Academic Student Affairs to ensure that some of the state level policies such as uh, articulation and uh, common prerequisites were adhered to um, the length to um, baccalaureate degree, you know, uh, credit hour length of baccalaureate degrees, and, and some other issues, limited access being one of them, which we'll see later today. Um, and it, it's, it's important to understand that the university uh, proposal coming through the university goes through a very extensive development process. It goes through a number of uh, faculty review committees all the way up through the provost office. Sometimes it does this twice, once as a, as a conceptual um, paper and the next time as a full-fledged proposal before it ever gets to their board of trustees. And it didn't make a lot of sense from uh, our perspective to have uh, our few staff trying to second guess all these curricular decisions. But on the other side of it, the universities we felt were in a much better position to uh, deal with some of the, the issues of um, of uh, duplication with regard to whether or not they were duplicating uh, programs that were in their area. And, and this was actually something that, that would be considered uh, good due diligence from a business perspective to make sure that, you know, that your um, estimates are going to be accurate and correct for the number of students that you bring in and also that your resources are there and that you're, um, that, that you're not, you know, basically competing even sometimes against your own departments for students. Um, Vicki is going to uh, talk a little bit more about this issue. But one thing that we did put into place, and this one was uh, uh, circled back to the, uh, the uh, agreement with the Office of Civil Rights. And if you look back on page 32, you'll see where there was a, a fundamental change that was, was made that clarified that first that, you know, that there's a uh, demonstrated need for program graduates, researchers, service, so the basically need and demand study that has to take place with a new degree uh, proposal, but also, you know, asking then, this is a new change in the policy, asking the universities to really take on the review of, um, of other degree programs that, within the system because at the stage that these proposals are being developed, that's really the appropriate time for them to start having conversations for, about collaboration or duplication. It's, you know, a lot of uh, resources and efforts go into developing a proposal and getting it past their board of trustees, and it, it becomes uh, really a, a problem, I think, uh, for uh, to get up to this board and then to have this board say no based, based entirely on a duplication issue. And it also, uh, I think, pushes the, um, the uh, universities to, uh, to have more open conversations with their sister institutions on programmatic issues. Um, the, um, we made a few changes. One of the major changes that we made was cutting out a section that was um, associated with um, getting legislative approval for programs that lead to licensure. That was changed during the uh, 2010 session, so we had taken that out. And um, if there's no questions about the, uh, the, the uh, language that I've covered so far, I'll ask Vicki to talk about OCR. Great, thank you. Thank you, Governor Duncan. Thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah, I've been asked to provide you with a brief, and I hope it will be brief, uh, overview of the state's relationship with the Office for Civil Rights. And I understand they're a little sensitive that they are the Office for Civil Rights, not the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, but the state has a very long history in dealing with the United States Office of Civil Rights when they were part initially of the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare back in the 70s. 
In fact, it was in 1970 that OCR uh, made a determination that Florida's higher education system violated Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which provides for equal access and opportunity for education without regard to race. Uh, and OCR worked with the state then to develop a plan to eliminate any remaining illegal vestiges of the state's former segregated system of higher education in Florida. Um, by 1978, uh, OC OCR had accepted Florida's desegregation plan, and that plan committed the state to a wide array of remedial measures designed to disestablish the structure of the dual system of higher education in Florida to desegregate student enrollment, to increase minority employment and representation on governing boards, and to enhance programmatic offerings, facilities, and budget allocations for FAMU. OCR monitored this plan, which the plan period ran from 1978 to 1985, but OCR actually did not determine that the state had successfully completed the plan measures until 1995. And by 1995, the U.S. Supreme Court had entered a decision in U.S. versus Fordyce, which examined the Mississippi higher education system and found that uh, even though states had taken steps to desegregate their systems, there were certain race-neutral policies that were still in place that continued um, a, a type of discrimination that was not acceptable under Title VI. Those types of policies related to differing admission standards for, their, for Mississippi's predominantly white and predominantly black institutions, um, program duplication, which seemed to cling to the old separate but equal that had been outlawed um, through Brown versus Board of Education, and uh, also mission alignment of the universities in Mississippi. So OCR took the Supreme Court's opinion very seriously and said even for states like Florida, Kentucky, Virginia, who we've released from the desegregation plan, we're going to work collaboratively with the states, those states, to enter into a series of partnership commitments for a period running from 1998 to 2003 so that we can ensure that there are no race-neutral policies that could inadvertently cause or have a discriminatory effect. And this partnership, uh, set of partnership commitments, it ran the, the gamut from K-12 to community colleges to the state university system and to private and independent institutions. So it wasn't solely focused on the SUS. It was across every educational sector in Florida. But as it relates to the state university system, it covered five main issues. Those related to students, employees, capital projects, and mis what they grouped as miscellaneous issues. The student issues, uh, the state committed to monitoring access and enrollment of minority students developing alternative admission criteria, um, providing funding for financial aid and funding for retention specialists, uh, analyzing the effect of any excess hour fee requirements on non-minorities, I mean on minorities, uh, ensuring minority students were not adversely impacted by dwindling resources in the state, and providing access for minority graduate students. Uh, with respect to employees, the state committed to reporting on faculty and staff diversity, which we do, uh, providing minority promotional opportunities, conducting a glass ceiling survey, and ensuring appropriate support for our university equal opportunity officers. Uh, for capital projects, most of that focused on getting adequate funding to FAMU for its capital projects for its schools of architecture, allied health, journalism, pharmacy, the College of Business uh, and Engineering schools. There were also FAMU specific issues in, in the commitment agreement. And those relate to uh, providing funding to augment programs in agricultural teaching, research and extension, funding to enhance the functions of the College of Arts and Sciences, funding for faculty development in the architecture school, funding for outreach scholarships and financial aid in the architecture school, uh, which was done in order to help the school attract a more racially diverse student population because that was the other side of the corn where it came to the series of commitments and even the desegregation plan. You know, recognizing the importance of an HBCU, there was still also recognizing the importance that we should strive for diverse student populations 
in what was then our predominantly white and our predominantly black institutions. So that was a goal of the desegregation plan and a goal of the partnership commitments. Um, and under miscellaneous, uh, we were committing to continued scrutiny of limited access programs uh, and continuing an academic review, academic program review process by university equal opportunity specialists to analyze programs for any possible negative impact upon racial minorities and with respect to academic programs at FAMU, they were to look to make sure that we were minimizing any unnecessary duplications of programs between SUS institutions. Uh, the OCR has not released the state from the partnership commitments. They are still monitoring. Uh, more recently in 2009, they sent a letter to then Governor Christ, and it covered again all educational sectors. They were requesting follow-up information so they could determine the state's progress with respect to the commitments as through K through 12, the community college system, now the, now the Florida college system, the SUS, and the private and independent institutions. We provided a voluminous response in May of 2009, and then we heard nothing further until June of 2010, and they've come back and they are taking a closer look at the issue of program duplication and what we in FAMU are doing to achieve a more racially diverse student population mix at FAMU. We met with um, Dr. Cynthia Pierre, who is the executive director of the Office for Civil Rights Atlanta Regional Office with the chancellor and several staff from OCR and our staff in September of 2010. And at that meeting, we discussed um, that one of the ways the old Board of Regents had looked at the issue of program duplication and its effect on FAMU uh, and also FIU at that time was in a Board of Regents policy, which after the Board of Regents was abolished, that policy essentially fell out during the multiple transitions that the SUS has had through varying, varying governing boards. So we committed to amending our program review regulation to reinsert that process so that we would be looking at if there is a program being proposed by another institution that substantially duplicates an existing program at FAMU, we would do an analysis. For us, that would be at the PhD level. For the university, since they approve back baccalaureate and masters, that would be at the university level, to determine if there's any adverse impact on FAMU's ability to uh, achieve and attract and main, well, maintain, I think the wording is, maintain, achieve or maintain student diversity in its existing program. So that's how we got to this portion of the regulation today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Um, I guess any questions of Richard or Vicki at, at this point? Um, obviously, we've been very involved in this, and the whole staff has been putting in a lot of time to make sure we've tried to cover this fully and you know, address, this, address all the various issues and components. Um, Dr. Ammons, I don't know, do you have any, as yeah, the president of FAMU, do you have any thoughts or comments you want to add? Are you comfortable with this regulation the way we have it drafted? Yes, after having uh, spoken with uh, both the uh, Office for Civil Rights and uh, the Chancellor and the staff, uh, I think what we are doing here today is uh, within the um, expectations that both the federal government and the state of Florida have as it relates to uh, the future growth and development of Florida and M University. Great. Thank you. Yes, Chair Parker. I have a question of Vicki. Um, Vicki, you mentioned that the, um, the idea that it's not the state university system, but it's the whole state of Florida that has this relationship with OCR. The, That's correct. The regulation that we're discussing, do we have something similar in the K through 12 or the community college? We, we're only here on our regulation, obviously, since we don't regulate K-12 or the community colleges. I've not been involved in OCR discussions with those two sectors. Okay, no. So you're saying we, we don't know whether they have something similar, I guess is my question. No, I wouldn't think K-12. I mean, this is program review. Okay. Uh, and I'm I can sorry. follow up with a, my counterpart for the Florida college system and find out. And I apologize. I guess the way I asked that question was confusing. I was just... Um, 
checking whether or not or wanted to have some comfort level that it's not something that um, just the state university system is complying with as a part of the relationship that the whole education system for the state of Florida has. That's correct. The yeah. partnership commitments covers all three sectors. And when they came back in 2009, they were following up on compliance from all three sectors and including privates. Okay. Any other questions? I just have one other question. Yes. Um, and are you aware, and I'm certain, I guess I should have asked you this beforehand so you could have prepared, but <laughs> are you aware of how long this relationship is, um, you know, will exist? Are they, they talking anything about you know, are there goals that, that we can reach that would suggest that there's a longer um, a need for us to have the type of monitoring that's um, now in place? Well, they haven't exactly given me an indication at the federal level as to how long they continue to monitor Florida's compliance again, you know, for all three sectors. Uh, they had, in 2009, indicated for all three sectors that several of the commitments had been met. So I think this is a follow-up process, but like with the desegregation plan that was to last from 1978 to 1985, it, we, the state wasn't released until 1995. So this could continue. Any other questions? Is there a motion for approval? Somebody? <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, great. Now we will get back on track with the agenda and go to item 3A, which is our um, request for an approval for a PhD in public health by the University of Florida. Um, we had a number of, a lot of information in our package. There has been some additional information that has been distributed, and it's been kind of a little bit of an evolving process, but I think to kind of start our discussion, if Dr. Glover, maybe you could step up and just kind of walk us through the program and it's the, the academic portions of that, we will go from there. Thank you. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to ask the Dean of the College of Public Health, Mike Perry, to join me. Absolutely. Uh, since he'll be more conversant with the details than I will. I will just preface uh, his discussion of this academic program by saying that we have a relatively new school of public health at the University of Florida. We're very proud that it was recently accredited. As part of the accreditation, the accrediting body expects continued development of our academic programs, particularly at the level of the PhD. Uh, we believe that there is a great need in the state of Florida for graduate, for, for additional graduates from PhD in public health programs and uh, there is national documentation on that need. So we feel that this fits in completely and coherently with the board's and the state's interest in increased production in STEM degrees. So with that, I think I'll ask uh, Dean Perry to uh, give you a precy of the academic aspects of the Great. program. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. As you all know, um, public health is a targeted area for growth in the state university system. It's anticipated that the workforce shortage in public health professions will reach over 200,000 people during the next decade. And graduates of programs of public health play a critical role in upkeeping the health infrastructure and contribute to cutting edge research and training in this area. The proposed PhD that we are putting forth has two areas of concentration within public health. The first is social and behavioral sciences, and the second is environmental and global health. Currently, the, the production of doctorally prepared experts in both of these areas is quite low, both in the state and nationally. So having a PhD in public health with these two concentrations will allow UF to offer the full complement of advanced training in public health, consistent with our accreditation requirements and appropriate expectations of a research one institution. I should note we already have PhDs in biostatistics, epidemiology, and health services research. Now, research on global environmental health is an emerging area of great importance because the migration of germs and microbes knows no borders. Just take a look over the past year of the examples of the H1N1 problem. 
UF um, is uniquely qualified, I think, to offer a PhD in these two specialties because we have uh, very important strengths in both of these areas. In fact, in the environmental and global health area, uh, the chair of our department was one of the first scientists to show the link between the, the transmission from pigs to humans of the H1, H1 virus. Um, our uh, request is um, um, supported by the deans of the two other accredited schools of public health in the state uh, at USF and FIU. Um, FAMU offers the uh, Doctor of Public Health uh, degree and has a similar concentration, but their, their program has a slightly different emphasis. There's some overlap, but it's slightly different. Their focus is to aim, I believe, if, uh, if I can speak on their behalf at this point, at educating people who are going to be uh, leaders in the practice of public health. We're targeting people who are going to be with a PhD degree who are going to be largely faculty members and research scientists. And we're, our attempt to help with the workforce demands is going to be to educate the people who are going to do, be doing the educators of the people who are going to be on the front line. The PhD programs across the state are relatively small and the need cannot be made, met by any single institution. And we believe that the addition of, of these programs at UF will help contribute to solving the, the problem that faces the state. Any um, questions from the academic side of, of the equation? The budget side, um, yeah, it, all the numbers and everything was in here. There was some initial corrections, and I think just from our staff perspective and review, um, Richard, yeah, <laughs> sorry, um, yeah, I think we've looked through everything, and I think we all feel confident that the budget numbers make sense now, and the projections tie, and. Yes, ma'am, um, and in fact, this uh, is going to be a fairly low-cost program for uh, UF to implement through reallocation of, of some funds and resources. So, okay. and they're, you're, they're, from that perspective, they are in the position to launch. Uh, right. We feel a, a very good program. Great. Um, there were letters from USF and FIU in your packages. Uh, my understanding is we also now have a letter with agreement between FAMU and UF that has been executed. Um, if anybody would like to see that, let us know. I don't know, Dr. Ammons, if you have anything you want to add, or we we good at the uh, uh, Florida A&M University uh, is in uh, support of the uh, PhD in public health uh, at the University of Florida. Our faculty and uh, staffs have uh, provost have uh, worked together to identify paths to collaboration uh, between the two institutions and the two programs. Further, there is a uh, commitment of support. Uh, as FAMU develops a PhD in public health <clears throat> and a school of public health, uh, that that support would be forthcoming uh, from the University of Florida as well. So we're, we're fine with where we are today. Great. Well, and I'd also like to thank your provost. I know she's put a lot of time in working on this and um, appreciate her being here today, too. And I, and I think this is a good example of there has been a lot of dialogue, a lot of cooperation, I think, between the um, both the, 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 at the provost level, at the public health level, and I would like to encourage that to con continue as we go forward. Are there, in, yes? Governor Martin. Can I get a further clarification? I think someone <laughs> said that there are about 200,000 jobs that are potentially available for persons with these degrees. Is that globally, is that the, you know, North America, and how many of those actually within the state, you think? The, uh, if I may, the Association of Schools of Public Health conducted a study last year on the workforce demands that are anticipated over the next decade. And looking at the numbers of people who will be retiring from, from positions within public health and the increasing demand, they projected that there's a need for more than 200,000 workers nationwide in the U.S. We don't have exact numbers for the projections for the state of Florida. And a further distinction between the two programs, uh, could maybe Dr. Ammons or you guys kind of again, specify what are the distinctive differences between the two programs? Um, 
to Cindy, do you I'm want to make, Cindy? Yeah, make your uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe the dean and the yeah. provost of uh, FAMU could address that jointly. Thank you. Let me first reinforce the fact that we are supportive of the UF program. Our deans, <clears throat> our, pardon me, our <clears throat> director of our Institute of Public Health, our dean of the College of Pharmacy, the, the school in which our institute resides, have discussed the programs. And as has been said, there are certainly a few arenas, <clears throat> pardon me, of overlap. Those arenas of overlap we are viewing as arenas for a collaborative future. As opposed to being competitive, they are being discussed, even as we speak, as opportunities for meeting more of the health of the public needs of the state. So yes, a DRPH program is different from a PhD program. The PhD program is designed to be a strong research-oriented program. Our DRPH program also has a strong research element, but that's by design. Typically, DRPH programs do not have that, the type of research that we, we, we provide, the type of research experiences that we provide our students. Our research is more applied, and that's deliberately designed as a part of our curriculum. As I understand the proposal for the University of Florida, their research is designed to truly take people into research positions, into faculty positions, and not that some of their graduates will not be involved in applied research, because I suspect that they will, and many of our graduates will end up in higher education <clears throat> and arenas of, of, of research. But by design, there are distinct differences between the two. But the most important part of it, <clears throat> as we look at it, is this opportunity for collaboration between the two institutions, between our graduates, between our faculty, between the practitioners in the state. Great. Did that answer your question, Governor Martin? Thank you. Any other questions? Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your efforts on this one. Okay, so we will now move on to item 3B, which is a request from the University of South Florida St. Petersburg campus for limited access status for the BA slash BS in entrepreneurship that was recently approved by USF's Board of Trustees. Because the USF St. Pete campus has a um, independent SACS accreditation, the USF St. Pete campus is considered to be the owners of the program curriculum and must seek the appropriate approvals as outlined in board regulations. This includes the limited access status for undergraduate majors. Um, university um, staff and board staff are available to answer any questions. Um, as we have done on a number of programs in the past, um, Governor Marshall and Governor Yost are also ready to share some of their observations. I think they took a, a good deep hard look at this program. Um, so if anybody has any questions for them, um, otherwise I would seek a motion for approval. Any further discussion?